Uh, thank you. Thank you very much here. So we're going to talk about in this novel, esophageal technique, uh, Lynx, a reflux management system. H how many people are implanting uh, Link, the Lynx device? Okay, here. So we'll, we'll teach you something. It'll be about technique. And, and I, I do think there's an opportunity here. I have uh, no disclosures, uh, although I will say uh, uh, Thorax Medical has been very good about providing me information from their registry, okay, in terms of up-to-date information on, on Lynx. So what's the magnitude of the problem with GERD? Well, we know 75% of esophageal pathology is sort of benign. 44% of people have monthly heartburn. 18% of non-prescription medications, okay, are heartburn related. There are 19 million cases per year at a cost of in excess of $10 billion, okay, related to, to medications and the treatment of GERD. It's a lifelong problem, okay? It doesn't go away. It affects younger people, it affects older people, and, and clearly extends, uh, decreases their quality of life. What are the key abnormalities? Okay, and Gerd, well, I think you see it illustrated here well. Primary is the loss of an effective uh, lower esophageal sphincter, and then secondary, okay, is the refluxed gastric fluids, whether it be acid, okay, or uh, bile. What are the goals of modern therapy? Well, to eliminate symptoms, improve quality of life, and develop a plan for potential lifelong management without the need for continuous medication. I mean, more and more I am seeing younger people coming to me worried about what are truly the long-term effects of these medications, medications that they're going to be taking, you know, not just for 10 years, you know, but 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Current therapy, well, current therapy is some sort of fundoplication, whether it be, you know, a Nissen fundoplication illustrated here, a door, a toupee, but some sort of fundoplication, okay, or the, the purple pill or some other medication. There's a therapy gap, okay, here that exists with, uh, with the treatment for GERD. I mean, the majority of patients, I will say, can be effectively treated, okay, with medication and do not, okay, need surgery. Then you've got the group that aren't effectively treated with medication, and down here on the little end is probably the people with the most severe GERD, and that's where fundoplication falls. So the majority of people do not need an operation for their GERD, and at the same point in time, there's this sort of gap in between where medications just aren't working. People are using increasing doses of medication. Uh, they don't have, okay, symptoms severe enough for a fundoplication, or they've read about fundoplication. And I will hold, okay, there's side effects, okay, to that operation that also affect people lifelong. Nissen fundoplication, some of the basics. You're going to reconstruct a new sphincter by wrapping the fundus around the lower esophagus. There's less than 50,000 of these operations performed in the United States, okay, each year. The side effects may include, as you know, dysphagia, both short-term and longer-term, early satiety, an inability to vomit, and perhaps belch. Uh, limited standardization. I think that's real important. A lot of my practice has become redo fundoplications. I mean, not a consulting day goes by at the Mayo Clinic that I'm not seeing at least one or two people that have had a fundoplication that for some reason has failed. Sometimes it's in the short term, sometimes it's in the long term, but that's an increasing uh, problem. And what do I think? Well, I always get the op note. We stress hard, get the op note. Well, when I read these op notes, I find out some are done with one or two curl stitches, some are done with 10 curl stitches, some have a 40 dilator down, some have a 60 dilator down, the wraps are two centimeters, three centimeters. Every now and then it's even done with absorbable suture, which I find hard to believe, but if the surgeon dictated it right, it's absorbable suture. So there is no standardization. When we get into links here, it may offer an opportunity for standardization. The operation, as we know, may not last lifelong. Again, if you're doing this in younger people, you're asking it to last. It's a mechanical repair, and you're asking it to last 10, 20, 30, 40, or even 50 years. And it is difficult to reverse. And we know, okay, when we take these things down, the results are never quite as good. <coughs> What is Lynx? Well, Lynx is a mechanical device that augments the lower esophageal sphincter seen diagrammatically here. It's a small flexible band of magnets enclosed in these titanium beads that are connected by individual titanium wires. And the magnets attract each other, okay, and that keeps the LES closed, preventing reflux. Peristalsis happens, and the magnets are able to be distracted by the peristaltic wave, and then once the, the uh, food gets down into the esophagus, the be beads reattract, okay, closing down the LES, preventing, okay, reflux and regurgitation. And you see it, okay, a little bit better here. We've got these uh, titanium casings and the magnets right here, and they're held together by individual titanium wires. So each of these beads has the capability of moving back and forth, okay, on itself. And then here it is in a closed fashion. 
What's some of the physiology about this? Well, normal peristaltic pressure is about 35 to 80 millimeters of mercury. The pressure associated with reflux is 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury. And the way they've sort of calibrated this thing is the link system provides a barrier of about 15 to 25 millimeters of uh, yield resistance, they call it. So it basically stays closed, okay, to reflux or regurgitation, and it opens to allow swallowing, belching, and vomiting. Now, just as I was uh, starting my residency, the angel chick prosthesis was pulled from the market, and uh, not a, oh, probably it's been five years since I've removed an angel chick prosthesis, but over the years, okay, this just uh, was a terrible device, and it's seen here for people who've never seen one. It's a silicone donut, okay, that was placed around the lo uh, lower esophageal sphincter, and they eroded, they slipped, they caused bleeding and obstruction, and, and it was, was uh, pulled from the market. Lynx, okay, I am worried about what's going to happen long term with Lynx. It has not been put in thousands of patients, it's about 1,800 patients worldwide, okay, to date. But uh, I am excited about the technology. What's different? This is dynamic, and that's what we think might be, uh, be, be the difference here. But I ho will hold, time's going to tell. It's going to take thousands of patients with long-term follow-up till we really know. What are the similarities between Nissen and Lynx? Well, both are put in laparoscopically, standard instrumentation and surgical technique. Uh, there's an augmentation of the lower esophageal sphincter. Okay, that's what you're doing with the fundoplication, and that's what Lynx does. What's the difference? Well, we stress with Lynx minimal, okay, hiatal dissection. We were just t hearing about that with the POEM procedure, and, you know, I think our goal should be minimal disruption of the hiatus if possible. The gastric fundus now remains intact. It's more reproducible. It's a standard size necklace. They're sized individually based on the diameter of the esophagus, but it's a very standard technique going in and a standard way of implanting it. Uh, hopefully there's a minimization, minimization of side effects, and clearly the magnets are designed to last uh, lifelong. Lynx was approved by the FDA in March of 2012, and it's indicated for patients diagnosed with gastroesophageal reflux disease, confirmed by abnormal pH testing, and continue to have GERD symptoms despite maximal medical therapy for the treatment of reflux. You shouldn't implant, okay, this device in patients who have known allergies to iron, nickel, stainless steel, or titanium. There's been a warning, okay, or actually a contraindication for a Lynx device in patients having an MRI scan. Okay, although the company has just gotten a conditional approval from the FDA for a 0.7 Tesla MRI. Well, that really didn't mean much to me at all, so I go to my MRI experts and find out a 0.7 Tesla MRI really doesn't do much, okay, for people. So the company recognizes this as, as a problem, and I do too, and a lot of the people we've turned down for links is because they basically have had MRI scans or have problems, okay, that are going to necessitate MRI scans. What do we know about MRI? Six people have had MRI scans worldwide. There have been none un no untoward events, okay? The magnets haven't come flying out of the patient, okay, or caused any harm. Um, two of the patients, the magnets basically stopped working, though. Some of the precautions, uh, basically large hiatal hernias, okay, or hernia greater than three centimeters, it shouldn't be put in. Barrett's esophagus, uh, short segment Barrett's esophagus, you might consider it. Certainly patients, though, who don't have any form of, of dysplasia. Longer segment Barrett's esophagus, though, it should not be put in. Grade C or grade D esophagitis, patients who have diaphragmatic uh, sort of stimulators, motility disorders of the esophagus, scleroderma, patients who have had esophageal or gastric cancer. I mean, I am getting called a lot of time, too, for the patients who either aren't candidates for traditional fundoplication surgery or have had failed operations, and people are thinking Lynx is going to be the bailout. No, right now, okay, Lynx is not the bailout, and we don't have enough of a track record, okay, to say anything about that. Uh, people who have bad dysphagia shouldn't be put in prior gastric or esophageal surgery, poor motility again, we've said. Patients who've had strictures or other uh, sort of abnormalities of the GE junction, esophageal gastric varices. Pregnant patients, okay, we're not implanting them in people right now who are pregnant or planning in the immediate future becoming pregnant, although the device has basically uh, been used in patient or has been put in and patients have ultimately gotten pregnant and there have been no problems, okay, with the, uh, with the pregnancy or the device. Uh, morbid obesity, BMI greater than 35, and then at least right now not in, in real young patients, patients under the age of, of 20. Again, preferred implantation techniques are going to be, when you will see a video in a second, a minimal dissection of the esophageal junction. We have to properly size the device, okay, and then properly position the device. So basically, we start the dissection, okay, here off on the left-hand side using the harmonic scalpel. The GE junction is going to be sitting right up here. Okay. 
left Kerr is right down along this side. In the initial trials that were done, there were several patients that did have uh, hiatal hernias. The device was put in. It seemed to function well, but at the moment, okay, we're, we're stressing some more straightforward patients and, and not patients with hiatal hernias. You save the hepatic branch of the vagus here, so you can work both above the hepatic branch of the vagus. And in this video, we didn't open up down below, but you can also work, okay, down below on either side, but try to save the hepatic branch of the vagus. The right curl will be seen shortly right here. And we're going to now bluntly start separating the esophagus, okay, from the right crew. And the big thing then is identifying the posterior vagus nerve. So we're going to anchor the device between the esophagus and the posterior vagus nerve. And that's what we think keeps it fixed in place. So now we're lifting up, and the posterior vagus nerve we'll see here in just a second, right there. So we create the window actually between the body of the esophagus and the posterior vagus nerve. You have to get the right angle here. If we go up this way, we'll end up basically into the left chest, but basically just create this window. If the fat pad is too big, we'll resect part of the fat pad to thin, thin things out. And this is the older device, okay, for sizing. And I just use this because this was a good video demonstrating the technique. I'll show you a newer device, okay, that they have, a new sizing device. This is still available, and this is a reusable sizing device. The newer device is disposable, but you just match the color-coded beads, and that tells you then what size, okay, lengths necklace to put in the patient. And then this is basically the device coming in. Again, there's two devices now. This is a threaded device, okay, just with uh, some Ethibon suture that will pull through. They also have a clasp mechanism now uh, that, that's available, so you don't have to pull the thread through. And then just a little titanium clip. The device holds, okay, the threads together. And there's the uh, necklace in place. And it's just approximating, okay, the esophageal wall. Okay, it, it can move around, okay, but it's just touching the esophageal wall. Are the lights back on? Yeah, actually, we've got a couple more videos oh, so we can keep this off. This is a, a new sizer device. We've used this in our last uh, two patients. Okay, makes it a little bit easier than that uh, color-coded bead system. But we've already gotten around the GE junction. Basically, Penrose drain is here, and then this little sizing device has a little sort of plunger on the end, and it's going to extend out this little curved magnetic sort of thread that you can just loop around the esophagus. Then you tighten it down up by the handle, and again, you want it just touching the esophageal wall, okay? I mean, you don't want it too tight. That then gets calibrated, okay, to the appropriate size necklace. It's a lot easier than sliding the beads back and forth. Uh, difference is, though, this is a disposable, okay, instrument, so you have to buy it for each patient. And then this is the new necklace, okay, that they've developed, uh, which is now, I think, available in the United States. It's been tried in Europe. But as opposed to the long threads held by the titanium clip, there's just like a little clasp, much like a necklace that can go into place. And then those can be fixed together. And again, the necklace is uh, just touching, okay, the esophageal wall. And you don't want it too tight. But again, minimal disruption of the esophagus. There you can see this time both above and below the hepatic branch of the vagus. And there's the necklace in place. And here's a, an esophagram, okay, from a patient basically at one year. This was a solid food, food bolus going through. Now we can bring up the lights, Mark. Thanks. So where are we with some of the results? Okay, basically there have been a, only actually just coming out, and I think in this month's issue of diseases of the esophagus is going to be a report on the safety in 1,000 patients, okay, worldwide. Other than that, there have been a number of articles, but just with at most 100 patients. And we basically see here, and the initial feasibility study that was 44 patients, they've been followed for 48 months. The pivotal study was the one that got FDA approval, 100 patients with three-year follow-up. There's a, a series that was published from Europe, Bonavina series, 100 patients, Journal of the American College of Surgeons. And then here's the registry data 
uh, that the company provided me with, which at the time they gave me this was 325 patients, but basically a uh, median of a year, okay, follow-up. Mayo Clinic, across all three Mayo Clinic sites, we've uh, implanted about 70, okay, of these devices. Our Mayo Clinic Florida, okay, facility was part of the pivotal study. And you can see here, okay, basically where people were pre-links on their Demeester scores and where they were basically post-links. Uh, when you look at GERD, uh, HRQL, okay, scores, again, here's where they were in the feasibility study, and there does overall appear to be a good improvement, okay, in median GERD HRQL scores. PPI utilization in a similar fashion, okay, has gone down. And then patient satisfaction. Uh, basically, the uh, follow-up now, okay, in these series is up to 48 months in the feasibility study. The uh, first device was actually implanted seven years ago in a patient uh, this past February, so there's one patient out with seven-year follow-up. But uh, you can basically see dysphagia is very low. Early on, these patients do have a dysphagia, and people have to get used to it. Uh, we do feed people uh, sort of a mechanical soft diet when the Lynx device goes in. It's sort of a conditioning, okay, of the, uh, of the magnets, if you will. And I don't think the magnets have to be conditioned, but what you want is maximal sort of distension uh, of the magnets, okay, in the first uh, several weeks. So as opposed to a lot of my fundoplication patients uh, that I'll send home on more of a full liquid type diet, uh, these patients, okay, you want eating softer foods, encourage them, okay, to eat softer foods. They do well for the first two weeks, and then about two weeks we've learned, okay, that dysphagia does set in, and it's maximal between two and about six weeks, and you just have to keep encouraging the people to eat smaller, okay, amounts of food, but sort of work their way uh, through that. And after about six weeks, the dysphagia seems to, to settle down. Um, you do see, okay, the people can, can belch, okay, and people are able to, to vomit. Quality of life, okay, overall, okay, as we put together a number of these different patients. Daily PPI usage, okay, is, is down pre, okay, therapy. Reflux affecting uh, food, okay, tolerance. All these things, okay, are basically improved. Uh, with the, uh, the Lynx patients, although there has not been, okay, the gold standard, which should be a randomized control trial yet, okay, between fundoplication and the Lynx device. Extraesophageal symptoms, that's also been looked at, and you seem to have improvements in people's respiratory systems, cough, voice changes, recurrent cough, uh, improvements, okay, in the patients with, uh, with Lynx. So in conclusion, okay, I think me mechanical LES augmentation using the Lynx reflux management system is a promising new treatment, okay, for GERD. There's now up to seven-year follow-up, and it appears to be, be safe. Uh, there have been uh, no deaths. Uh, as we said with MRI, there have been no problems. Erosions, in all the series published to date, okay, there's no reported erosions. The company, again, has been forthcoming. There are four erosions worldwide, okay, and over 1,800 patients. So it's four. Two of them they know were technical issues. When you create that window in back, of the esophagus, it's very easy, I think, to denude part of the esophageal muscle layer. And that happened in one of the patients, and they're actually doing uh, methylene blue studies on the patient and still implanted the Lynx device. That probably would have been a red flag for me, okay, to not put the device in. But again, I think this device has not been put in thousands of thousands of patients and does not have long-term follow-up, so I think we need to be, uh, be cautious uh, with it, although I am optimistic about the technology. The patients I've put it in are all very pleased, okay, with it and have not had problems. I think we have to select the patients well, and uh, in the end, I hope that the results are, are more reproducible than traditional fundoplication, but then as I've alluded to, studies with larger numbers of patients and longer follow-up are, uh, are necessary. Thank you.